pues se mueve, ahora es nuestra vez, quebrando las fronteras de una buena vez contra esta gente burgués. Como ves, por causa de esta burguesía, la desigualdad crece día a día en nuestra ciudad. Mira los jailores paseando por el... Hello and welcome to Bolivia for this special edition of Environment, a landlocked country rich in mountains and minerals, but the poorest in South America. Bolivia has become one of the most outspoken critics when it comes to global action on climate change. So as UN talks open in Mexico, we've come to get the Bolivian perspective. Coming up in this week's show... You'll see that Bolivia is pushing for ambitious goals at Cancun, calling on governments to give as much to protecting the environment as to their defence budgets. Next to the city streets where hip-hop artists stage impromptu concerts to highlight the effects already being felt, notably water worries. Then it's into the wild to the copper mining village of Korokoro, where factory and families clash over how land should be used. Finally, we travel east to the border of the Amazon to see whether or not putting a price on trees can help protect the forest. The Andean glaciers that can be seen surrounding the cities of La Paz and El Alto are melting fast and the World Bank says that they could be gone within the next 20 to 30 years, threatening the lives of millions. With such a panoramic reminder, Bolivian delegates taking part in talks in Cancun are determined to push for some serious change when it comes to tackling global warming. A tribute to Mother Earth, the Pachamama. In Bolivia, her rights must be respected, and so shortly after the unsuccessful talks in Copenhagen, a counter-summit was held in Cochabamba. It set clear, ambitious objectives for Cancun. The main demands are to limit the global rise in temperature to one degree Celsius, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to 50% by 2017, to put aside 6% of developed nations' GDP to fight against the effects of climate change being felt in the developing world, and finally, to lift patent barriers to allow the transfer of technological know-how. Bolivia is pushing for the Kyoto Protocol to stay in place, because that's at least a bit better than what developed nations agreed on in Copenhagen. Bolivia feels that its voice was silent at the UN talks and that the developed world is monopolizing control. It stems from colonization and its effects, not just the extraction of the world's riches by the rich, but also a denial of cultural diversity, a denial of local knowledge of numerous groups of people who live in close harmony with nature. At the 16th annual UN climate talks in Mexico, Bolivia is determined to speak out and hopes that the US and China will listen. Demand for water here in the city of El Alto now outstrips supply. Not every home has its own tap, and so communal ones like this often have to serve up to 80 families. One resident, Nina Uma, hopes that her hip-hop will help highlight the situation. Let's take a listen. Amidst the hustle and bustle of Keha Market, a voice that stops people in their tracks. Niña Uma, a name which in Aymara means girl of the water, gives her voice to Mother Earth, La Pachamama. The water, the air, Mother Earth, they're not things, they're not items you can trade. They're living things, things we need for life. I know it sounds crazy, but for us, that's how we see it. Global warming, water shortages, Ninia Uma and her group aren't lost for lyrics, rapping about ecology and anti-capitalism. Water worries are omnipresent in El Alto, where women wash their laundry in the city drains. For Fado, it's a scene of inspiration and anger. Water is essential for lots of multinationals, for companies like Coca-Cola. Water is just a commodity to make money with. They are bottling the resources of local populations. 
drought is gaining ground around El Alto. Betsabe Avalon may be lucky enough to have a well within the walls of her home, but every year she has to dig a little bit further to find water. Our well is drying up. We're scraping the bottom. In the distance, glaciers, which provide one quarter of El Alto's water, are melting at an alarming rate. Last year, the Shakaltaya glacier disappeared, a decade before scientists had predicted. Below the barren slopes, young girls like Juana learn quickly how precious water is and to mind every single drop. From the city to the countryside, we're now in the rural village of Korokoro. And after a 23-year break, they've now started reproducing copper here. It means a $21 million investment, but yet there are locals who are not happy, saying that their land has been taken from them without any consultation or compensation. The wide open plains of Bolivia rise and fall as far as the eye can see. But in this peaceful setting, a battle rages. Local farmers and indigenous here are outraged over a copper mine that they say is stealing their resources. The people get about 12-20% of the water. And the mine, they take about 80%. From the well, two pipes twist and turn over the countryside. The red pipe goes to the mine, the grey one to the village of Korokoro and its 5,000 plus inhabitants. A handful of families here claim to have lost not just water, but land and freedom since the mine opened a year ago. Carmen Martinez wants to take us to see the source of our rage, but she's afraid. We're threatened, really, really in danger. They tell us that we're enemies of the state, that we're traitors of the village and they want us to disappear. Del pueblo. Finally, a dawn departure is decided on, but even then distance is kept. Carmen looks down on the mine, on the site where she used to live. We're not listened to at all. We've been trying to fight this mine for three years already. We've tried everything. We've brought in independent observers to look at how it was constructed. This mine has just destroyed us. A new article has been added to the Bolivian constitution, which states that while they may not have legal papers giving them official ownership to land, indigenous communities must be consulted over changes to their environment. They say the mine never fulfilled this obligation, an accusation the director fails to deny. It's hard to explain. There are lots of companies open for years and we're not going to ask them to carry out a consultation, are we? There used to be a mine here before. Over claims that the mine is polluting the local environment, however, Director German Elias is crystal clear. There is 40% water and 60% sulfuric acid in the basins. But we don't pollute any land. The black plastic membrane around the basin is checked constantly. And if we spot the smallest problem, we repair it. The mine created 500 direct jobs, much to the joy of the majority of villagers. But farmers in the region insist that they have seen the health of their herds suffer since the mine reopened. And the indigenous community here is determined to continue the battle in the International Court of Human Rights. Well, we've now travelled east and are on the border of the Amazon. As you can see around me, these trees have been burnt. A few rice seeds were sown, but with this year's drought, little of that will grow. In a bid to cut down on this type of destruction, a project called Our Bolivia has been set up, with foreign investors encouraging farmers here to adopt the tree as a crop that can bring them profits and help protect the environment. Inside the wilderness of the Amazon, Herman Salinas, who works for Our Bolivia, is visiting farmers trying to convince them to plant trees. In 20 years, this wood will be able to be resold at around $61,000 a hectare. 
But most farmers here are thinking short term, cultivating corn and other food crops to satisfy their daily needs. The R Bolivia project is trying to promote trees as a long-term investment, which offers greater returns. I get some money to help clear my land, to prune the trees, and they offer help in keeping food on the table. But I'll have to be patient before I get any real money. When the money starts coming in, everyone involved will realize that trees are revenue. And so as soon as one crop is felled, they will replant. Our Bolivia, which is financed by foreign investors, helps prepare the land to plant the trees, but also checks farmers' progress and the process of turning the wood into planks for retail. For this part, it takes 50% of all money earned. The farmers remain the owners of the land. We just share everything from the base of the tree all the way up. Sharing their trees is a long-term commitment. The 800-plus farmers taking part in the project have to sign a contract that binds into our Bolivia for over 20 years. Once you sign on the dotted line, both parties have to be committed. I can't break the contract, and neither can they. Our Bolivia doesn't want to stop here. It would like to become part of the RED projects, which are recognised by the UN, allowing countries to gain carbon credits by investing in trees and cutting down on deforestation. But the Bolivian government isn't a fan of the idea. We're not in favour of the carbon market because it means putting a price on nature. It makes trees nothing more than sticks of carbon. For us, this is just one part of the forest and it overlooks the value of its biodiversity, of the entire ecosystem. For the Bolivian authorities, the message is clear. The forest and all its trees are not for sale. Well, that brings us to the end of this special edition of Environment. A very big thanks to everyone who worked on it, notably our producer in Bolivia, Patrick Vanier. Thanks also to Thomas Dijenski, Young Jim and Loic Baru. I'll see you back in Paris for a new edition next week.